Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect Pacific Northwest authors with new listeners and provide advice for inspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. Hi there, listeners. Today, I am happy to introduce a new author friend that I have met. Um, it, her name is Trisha um, Harley McCarthy. You'll probably hear me call her Trish because I slip into um, calling people by their first name. We'll make sure that when you go to show notes, we'll have all of our information there. So say hello to everybody, Trish. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Honestly, it's great. Awesome. Thank you. So, so tell us, let's start out a little bit about yourself. Tell our listeners first what state you live in. And if you have a day job, explain what that job is, because I think you have a very interesting thing that you do as well as writing. So share those two things with us. Oh, okay. Well, um, I live in Independence, Oregon, and um, I'm a transplant from California. So mm -hmm. we wanted to, my husband retired, so we came up here and I live outside of Salem. Um, and my day job, I do, I actually do some life coaching. Um, yes. I've started doing that again. And um, I do a lot of um, spiritual work, too, when I'm doing the life coaching. So I kind of integrate the two together. It, it's, a, it's a great blend. And a lot of times, a lot of the spiritual truths I talk about actually find their way in my book. Oh, that's exciting. See, when I was um, doing some research on you, I'm like, I wonder if she's going to do a book just about life coaching, you know, things like that, some tips for people, because there's always a market for that. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. It's kind of, it's kind of, you know, I kind of have a approach of, of um, I like to do, um, I guess, techniques, give people techniques that are easy and quick, because mm -hmm. I'm not into the I'm not into the meditation for, you know, 30, 40 minutes, like mm -hmm. a sitting like a pretzel. That's yeah. not my thing. So <laughs> I think people appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, when and if you do some sort of book on that, we'll have you back for it because <laughs> I'm sure I'll be. I ready. will. Sure. <laughs> Good. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us, um, besides that, a little bit up front what you want our listeners and your future readers that hear about you on this podcast to know about you? Oh, well, um, I'm I'm a, kind of a late bloomer as far as an author goes. I started writing when I was about 38, mm -hmm. and I didn't really I didn't really finish my first standalone book until I was in my 40s. So right on track um, with you. <laughs> yes. So you know, it's been a really awesome experience because I really didn't know what I was doing mm -hmm. at first. Mm -hmm. I had to learn everything. So basically how I started out was uh, writing fanfic um, yeah. for Bridget Jones Diary, which I fell in love with when I first saw the movie and I loved the character so much. I realized there was fan fiction out there. Uh -huh. yeah. And so I started writing my own uh, journal about that on post on, on fanfic. It's still available. It's, mm -hmm. it's really the, the grammar and, and everything is probably horrid. But the story <laughs> is actually pretty darn good. Yeah. And I started getting reviews and I thought from there, well, gee, couldn't I write my own, you know, book? And I, and I ended up doing that. And part of the inspiration through that was Colin Firth because he's my favorite actor. Uh -huh. So I kind of loosely based a character on him and a character on me kind of sort of as a banker slash a uh, writer wannabe in the book. So it, oh, cool. it was a great, it was a great start for me. How awesome. You know, I've heard that story. I can't tell you how many times from authors, <laughs> not just here in the Pacific Northwest that I've talked to, but elsewhere where fan fiction really was or catalyst to get started. I, and I think it's awesome. You know, and there's a very famous yeah. fiction book that's floating around nowadays that started that way. I think it was right. Jordan, right? So um, I love it. That's, that's so, so great. So tell me, when did you feel like you were really an author? So, you know, where, where was that moment like for you? I think, you know, it's kind of a lonely moment because all of a sudden your author, your first book shows up, you know, your author copy shows up in the mail and mm -hmm. you open it and it's just kind of you and nobody else around, you know, my husband was at work. So I was, I was kind of overwhelmed, I guess. And, and, um, it was exciting mm -hmm. and I wish I wasn't marketing myself at all at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, 
So it, it was kind of a surreal event, but I don't think I really started feeling that until this, this recent series that I started doing because everything just started blossoming for me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was just the starting point, yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about marketing because that's one thing I, I probe a lot of authors about because um, as yeah. you probably have learned about me just a little bit is I'm aspiring author. That's why I started the podcast. I haven't quite published yet. I'm in the process of learning about publishing and all of that. And that's why this podcast started was because there's so much great value in hearing what other people have done. Um, and and it is a lonely journey in most cases. And so I was like, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm going to start reaching out. And so thus the podcast. <laughs> so. Right. And I think that's great because I, I think um, how I learn is I read a lot by authors of, of the same genre that I love. And it mm -hmm. just inspires me and it makes me a better author. And, and yeah. learning other people's journeys um, is similar or not. Or you learn something. I try to learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. So there's always something to learn. Never, mm -hmm. never, you're never at effort. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> no, 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 I agree. So you are published. So tell us what you have published, like the titles. And then we're going to go a little bit after that and talk about what kind of publisher you are, like self, indie, that kind of thing. So share with our listeners your titles and, and then we'll go into the actual. Okay. Publishing. Okay. I've got it. I've got a total of seven romance novels. The first one was my only standalone novel. And I say novels because it's around 90,000 words. And um, so that one is just as he is. It was kind of a misnomer on the Bridget Jones scene where Mark Darcy tells Bridget he likes her just the way she is. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my inspiration. Mm -hmm. And then my second set of books um, are the Astral Realm series. And those have to do with a fantasy romance. And it's it kind of revolves around archangels and mortals oh, cool. and um, it is, it's very cool. It was so much fun writing those two. And the first one is written among the stars uh -huh. cool. and the second one is uh, beneath the stars. So both of those are actually, I'm going to start a third one on that series. So that's those the next two. And those are both novellas. Okay. And then the, the next one I wrote was called uh, dimensions. And that was a kind of a paranormal mm -hmm. slash um, spiritual kind of journey for a, for a cop, a cop that um, encountered some otherworldly lights and he doesn't understand and he doesn't know. And he, he gets involved with this woman who he's making a call with and it, they just start down the road together experiencing these really strange events. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, Second one I wrote was, um, believe it or not, was about an Elvis conspiracy theory oh. and a gentleman, <laughs> and a gentleman uh, who was doing research in the field for like 25 years. He just he knew the he knew the material, and if you looked at it, it was fascinating. I mean, it it really was amazing. This material that looked like the Elvis didn't really die. Uh -huh. So um, I did indescribably blue, which is based on one of Elvis's songs and um and and kind of did a fiction piece inspired by true events so that was fascinating to write oh i love and it and then followed <laughs> yeah it was that was a great book um and then followed by my granite bay series which is recent and i just published two of the first and the second book the first one is accidentally in love which i'm going to be reading an excerpt from and the second is falling accidentally in love oh so, I love that. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah, and they're based in the Pacific Northwest because I write where I, I write about places I live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. So, are you self published? Are you with an independent little small publishing house? Or are you traditional or a hybrid of kind of all of them or mixed? I was a, a mix. The first, mm -hmm. um, the first publisher I went through was Ex Libris for my first standalone number, novel, Just As He Is. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, you could self publish. Cool. So, I did. <laughs> And I published through Kindle and Create Space, and now Kindle has a print version, so mm -hmm. it was perfect because um, I knew Kindle very well. So now I've really learned how to upload and get the things published and get out there, and it's amazing how easy it is these days. I know that that's the thing that draws me. Uh, I'm definitely leaning towards self publication, um, and it, it 
draws me because I think about 10 years ago, I was looking at publishing at the time. It was still rather traditional, except it was more, you could also go with um, publishing companies that would send you your books, you know, and then you'd have, you'd have yeah. inventory. And I was like, I'm not really interested in having a bunch of inventory in my house. <laughs> you right. Know? Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so I love the self publishing process and I'm learning so much about it. So, um, so what I found one thing and is that the cover design when you're self publisher and you're going through whatever Amazon or whatever you're doing, you know, you're doing some cover design work yourself. Do you do it yourself? And if so, like, what do you yes. use? What? Cause I'm yes. telling you some of the romance novels uh, are quite steamy covers. <laughs> and so I'm like, how yes. do they do this? Where do they get their clip art and all that stuff? <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, um, actually, I design all my covers except the very first one. Um, I did go to design school, so that gave me a different element to add to my, my books. Mm -hmm. And actually, what I do is I come out with my cover first, and that's an inspiration for me for the story. It, it's, you know, it's kind of like a vision board, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it just gives you that vision for the, for the storyline. So I've done all of my covers. Nice. Very nice. Cause I know there's yeah. some other, there's some other products and things you people can use and I've been looking at them, but I'm interested. I, I tend to gravitate towards doing everything myself. So I'm like, I don't right. know, and I'm covered. I think that's, yeah. yeah. And I think that's smart because I think you should know how to upload your manual. You know, I've gotten people to help me, but I think you should need to know from soup to nuts exactly what you need to do in order to, um, if and have a team of people around you to help mm -hmm. you to have mm -hmm. a team of people to help me. But yeah. at the same time, I want to know how to do everything myself because if that person is not available, then I can step in and do whatever exactly. I need to do for yeah. publishing. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. So I come from a background with my husband in the music industry, which we were um, oh. music. And so I've been down the roads on the music side of it with, um, nice. you know, producing music and then you know, selling it and, you know, everything from merchandising to web design, all the whole, everything agents, not, we don't, didn't call them agents, you know, they were managers and, you know, contracts and all that kind of stuff. And because of all that, I'm like, I can do this myself <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but speaking of that, um, a lot of aspiring authors or are, are no matter what, um, if they're traditional or if they're going self publishing, they are looking at ideas of possibly, they could be playing with the idea of getting an agent. Have you, are you, agent do you have an agent are you thinking about that and if so kind of walk us through that process if not that's okay but I like to ask authors about that because it seems to be a question I get from other people all the time <laughs> that that's an interesting question no I don't have an agent um, I do pretty much all my all my marketing and you know all myself except for I have pers two personal assistants well, so that that really helps a lot and um, as far as the agent goes, I mean, the agent's out there, you know, trying to rack up a deal with a publisher for you. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I haven't had that. I haven't come across someone who's going to want to represent me maybe at some point, mm -hmm. but right now it's me mm -hmm. yeah, and my assistant. Yeah. So how nice to have an assistant. When I saw that you had one, I told my husband, I need a personal assistant too. And he laughed. <laughs> and he goes, Someday you will have I one. Know. <laughs> I so know. I know. Absolutely. And I couldn't, I couldn't live without these two gals that are amazing, talented women. And one's in the design for my website. The other, she does all my social media because yeah. half of it, I don't quite understand or get like what I meant. Instagram. Awesome. I'm not fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so if you need a referral, I'll be happy to refer you. Well, my, <laughs> my youngest daughter is in that age bracket. And the minute she heard that, she's like, why don't you hire me? And I'm like, yeah, why don't I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, seriously, <laughs> that that's a great suggestion. Yeah, because yeah. A ki you know, kids or, you know, younger folks these days yeah. are so technology oh, gosh, evolved. They, they really are. They do. So, <laughs> yeah. so the aspect also that really comes up, regardless if an author is traditionally published or anything else, um, I I do find, and you already touched on this, the marketing. Authors absolutely need to be marketing themselves. So, um, right. What are what are kind of some of the techniques and tips that you have been doing for marketing? Um, I pick your brain because I always pick up something new almost every time. Or you know, we can share with others kind of some tips. 
so basically what I did was I, I don't know if you know who Helen Fielding is. She wrote Bridget Jones diary Mm -hmm. and that whole, that whole um, diary came about because she wrote a column in the, I believe it was the independent in the UK. And so every, I don't know if it was every week she'd be, you know, she'd write her little serial about Bridget and then Mm -hmm. one thing led to another. So she, she had a circulation going and then it turned into a book and then it turned into a movie. So I kind of take the same approach. Um, I do some short stories and then I release So I do it. My, my PA does a, um, does a teaser through the week of mm-hmm. the upcoming short story. And on Friday she publishes the short stories because I think it's important if people are going to invest money in your book, they want to see what you're writing, exactly. how, how you write mm-hmm. and the co- content you write. So I seem to be some, somewhat successful releasing short stories doing that so people are familiar with my writing mm-hmm. and they get to know you know me a little bit and you know what I have to offer as far as an author goes mm-hmm. that's a great plan I'm kind of going the route right now of blogging um, I'm going to start um, depending uh, there's there's a new not new but it's a to z challenge for April so depending on when people hear this this might have already started <laughs> um, and it's a challenge for bloggers to blog every day of April except for Sundays and one of my other author friends told me about it I'm like oh that's such a great way to really inspire yourself to do some blogging but also to get some of your writing out there and so I've been working on that so great idea um, another thing yeah. that I've been looking at it and it's kind of the manifestation of this podcast really for me is a support group of writers and getting in a network of some sort. Um, did you have your own support group and were you part of a writing group or professional organizations as you started or were you completely solo? <laughs> um, well, I did try that. I did try a, an, an online um, circle that, um, it was really a really a, a ne- kind of a negative experience for me because oh. they didn't they didn't want to critique you they wanted to criticize you there's a oh, big difference yeah. to me and they would yeah. criticize what i was my my research and time mm-hmm. frames and it just got to be very um it was i was disheartened by it and i mm-hmm. just felt like i wanted to give up but i didn't mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I just decided I needed to believe in myself. I think mm-hmm. that's the key um, because no one's going to be your best cheerleader except for you. I agree with that hundred <laughs> percent. It's so true. So I'm sorry that was a negative experience and maybe someday in the path, you'll be surrounded by others that are supportive enough to give you the honest oh. feedback that you need. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. No, I have, I do have, I do have a support group. Um, okay. I do have some author friends that mm-hmm. are great support and I keep them seem to attract more people you know I'm starting to mentor people now which is amazing one of my beta readers she's actually doing a writing she's doing writing and and posting on fanfic so I am trying to be a mentor the way I wish someone would have been been for me I don't want to be this critical person and I want to encourage not discourage that's awesome. That's kind of where my story is too. Is I mean, I'm in higher education for my day job, and I'm a mentor for a university for other students that are um, working That's- on their bachelors. And so I gravitate towards that kind of aspect of wanting to help other people. I get so much right. benefit from it, and so um, I think support groups are great. But you really do have to be careful who you're listening to, so because we're already self-critical, I think. And so if we yep. have people feed that, we don't need them to feed that to if we're going to believe in what we're doing. <laughs> so right, so, I have. I think I have a team of between eleven and twelve beta readers. Oh, that's. I awesome. mean, these ladies. The, these ladies devote their entire time and some of them have been with me for four or five years now. And it's amazing that they are so supportive and, you know, they, they tell me when things need to be fixed and that's great. That's what I want them there for. But at the same time, it's such a cohesive and supportive group. It, it makes me want to be a better writer that's overall. Fantastic. But you're very fortunate to have good readers as for feedback. I mean, I believe that yeah. a lot of people make the mistake of maybe having only their family members read for them. And our family members mm-hmm. are going to tell us it's great. They're not going to give us the kind of feedback that we may need, right? So <laughs> um, one thing I've heard um, a lot of 
people do is they hire editors, like they actually hire an editor. And I'm kind of playing around mm -hmm. with that idea. Um, have you have you done that in the past, or you relied on your bit your readers? I I did, and then I came to the conclusion that um, there's different editors out there, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize this. Um, um, my manuscripts are pretty clean most of the time, mm -hmm. but I've I've kind of gone from the editor version to a proofreader. Gotcha. So that's really where I need someone to really yeah. have to do. But you know, the beauty of actually self-publishing is that you can always update your manuscript and upload yeah. it. And if you find something that isn't right, and I have found things because mm -hmm. we're all human, we mm -hmm. we all miss things. So yes. I just fix them, correct them, and move on. Yep. Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome um, insights. So Trish, tell me what keeps you going as an author and what are, what's your inspiration? Um, I, you know, my inspiration is to, my inspiration, my goal, end all goal is to be a New York Times bestseller, mm -hmm. um, Amazon bestseller and uh, USA Today bestseller. Fantastic. That is my inspiration. That's my focus. And and what inspires me most is when I'm able to submit a chapter to my beta readers and they love it. Mm -hmm. And that, that is such a great high that, that you know, you're in the right, your right um, space yeah. of the story and moving it forward and, you know, propelling it into this great book. So those are my inspirations. Awesome. Well, they're great inspirations <laughs> and I will be cheering you on all the way. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So, For a couple of final thoughts before we move into your reading. So I'm very excited to hear your reading. Um, okay. Um, what would you like your, the listeners for the podcast and your future readers to know about you and your future work? Well, um, right now I'm finished. I just finished up the third in the series of the Granite Bay series, uh, staying accidentally in love. So that's in proof right now. So that's coming out hopefully the end of this month. And then the next thing I'm working on simultaneously is, uh, my hockey romance book, which I just have fallen in love with these characters and the storyline. And, um, cause I love hockey. Um, oh, yeah. and I read, i I've read some great hockey romance novels. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, this would be so much fun to do. So I'm kind of basing it on the San Jose Sharks, who are my team, Go Go Sharks, and um, a, 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 one of the, the players. And so it's been it's been really so much fun. And then later on in the summer, I'm going to be um, consulting with a lady, a friend of mine who uh, is into Celtic magic and Strigat, oh, which is a Italian magic. So we're going to, we're going to be doing a series of uh, Celtic magic books. Very and um, interesting. yes, it's going to be really a fun read. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm Very looking cool. forward to that one. Very cool. Good. Okay. So now is the time for listeners. I know you guys have been waiting to hear Trisha's um, reading. I always make everybody wait because I like to ask all these questions first. Um, so why don't you set the stage for what you're going to read for us and share kind of what you can about briefly the situation, the setting, the characters, the background, so that we can settle sure. in and really picture what's going on when you read. Sure. Um, this accidentally in love um, has to do with it revolves around the tan town of Granite Bay um, here in Oregon, but it's actually based out of uh, California, so a place where I where I lived. Mm -hmm. So I just brought the town up here, but it's based on the town I live in, and so I kind of I I always write local. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's based about um, a, a group of friends. Uh, one of them comes to town. He's a new guy. He's a, a really handsome veterinarian, uh, equine vet. Mm -hmm. So he takes care of horses. And then the other character is Kenda. She, um, Noah is the vet. And then Kenda is the, um, the lady who runs the horse sanctuary. So it's kind of a match made in heaven, but their, their paths cross from the path. So everything kind of culminates together and comes full circle. So they're both not, they don't want any relationships because they've both been in bad relationships. And it turns out the relationships have to do with their exes that they knew in a prior, prior uh, town. So it just, it all culminates in the town of Granite Bay. Okay. Well, we'll let you go ahead and start reading. Okay. This is the prologue. It's Noah from five years ago. 
Today is one of the most pivotal moments in my life and as a UC Davis Aggie. It's my last day leading my team down the field with the opportunity to win the Big Sky Conference championship game. We lead the conference with 10 to 1 record. I look over at the sideline to see the signal from my offensive coordinator pacing back and forth, gesturing wildly as he talks into his headset to the coaches in the booth. It is a third and 10 in the fourth quarter with less than 30 seconds on the clock. My heart is racing as I call an audible after reading the defense at the line of scrimmage. They're showing signs of an all-out blitz. I change the play from a run to a screen pass, which should work beautifully against the defense's pressure. I take the snap from the center, dropping back, and look to my right and pump fake to pull the defense away from the screen. The defense and offense square off, and I can hear the sounds of grunts and groans of sheer manpower reverberating as helmets and bodies collide. I feel the defensive line and the linebackers bearing down on me as I slowly drift away and drop the ball over their extended heads. Out of the corner of my eye, I see my running back doll, number 23, wide open. The crowd in Aggie Stadium is going wild as I drop past to him near the 25-yard line. Ricky jumps up and makes a perfect catch as we've always done a thousand times during practice. He accelerates along the sideline outrunning a 300-pound defensive lineman hot on his tail. Dahl cuts right to his left to avoid a tackle and runs smoothly into the end zone. I raise my arms in victory after the touchdown. My coach calls a timeout, and the ref blows the whistle, stopping the clock at 16 seconds. Our kicker, Diaz, and placeholder, Frankel, come onto the field, and as we pass each other, I give them each a high five and head over to the sideline. I pull off my helmet and reach for a towel, and a Gatorade. I mop the sweat off my face and chug down my Gatorade. I watch our special teams break the huddle and go to the line. They pause, set up, and execute a perfect snap to Frankel. The defensive line for Sacramento State rushed the kicker, but Diaz gets the ball in flight and through the uprights, scoring the extra point to win the game. The excitement in Aggie Stadium erupts into a deafening roar of people cheering, yelling, and surging into the field. I watch my teammates celebrating their triumph. In the middle of the chaos, I look up into the stands and search for her, Charlie. Her face is flushed with excitement, smiling and waving at me. I run over to the bleachers near the railing as she comes down to greet me. I reach up and pull her over to the side and into my arms. I swing her around in sheerulation. Her long black hair swirls around us like a veil. I set her down gently as her body slides along mine. I hold Charlie flush against me as a camera flash goes off and my lips slide over hers. We're lost in the moment from the wind and the surprise I've planned for the last two months. As we come up for breath, I look into her dark chocolate eyes and smile. Hi. I kiss her again. We try to alleviate the nervousness, but I can't shake it. Hi back. Charlie grinned back at me. When Charlie smiles at me, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. And right now, I want to make her the happiest girl and make her mind forever with our families, teammates, and our fans as our witness. I glance over to Patrick, giving him the signal, who is rigged with an earpiece and informs the broadcast booth to begin the announcement. The sportscaster, Sharm Wilson's voice, comes over the stadium PA speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Turn toward the bleachers for a significant occasion. People curious about the announcement face the bleachers, filled with my teammates, including Charlie and me. I interlace my hands with her as we anxiously wait for the surprise. A few select team members are each standing holding a stunt card. I give a nod to Patrick who gestures to them to flip the card. I'm watching my Aggies in bold red letters, Charlie, will you marry me? I kneel down before Charlie and present her with a black velvet box. I open it up to reveal a two carat princess cut diamond. Charlie, shocked, places her hand over her mouth and surprised with tears glistening her eyes. Sweetheart, I love you with my entire heart and soul, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? That's the prologue. Chapter one, Kenda, present day. I look over at Lori and Bella gossiping about the new veterinarian who blew into town just a few days ago. The way the two are going on about him, you'd think he was David Beckham or George Clooney who settled into Granite Bay instead of a hot veterinarian with an Aussie accent. Big deal. I try to focus on the paper, but the chatter threw me off my concentration. For two, for two mature women, they are acting like a couple of teenagers with a huge crush on a rock star. I just wanted to sit my skinny latte in peace. 
Bella Bruce is the hub of the town, which included coffee, gossip, and the most decadent muffins. Bella made the most, the best Marion Berry muffins in the state. Not too, not too light, not too dense. And of course, Bella reigned as the queen of knowing everyone's business. Today's hot topic is Mr. Hot DVM. Luckily for me, I prefer the quiet life away from prying eyes in the gossip mill. I come to town once a week to shop and sit in the cafe to enjoy my one luxury, a tall latte. I am completely ignored in favor of the mysterious stranger. Wanda at the AM PM told me he had the most gorgeous smile. Bella put her hand over her heart in a grand gesture as she accepted as she was accepting an award. The red-haired, full-busted owner of the cafe with dark blue eyeshadow and thick eyeliner missed her calling as an actress. Her bright pink uniform clashed with her bright red lipstick. I rolled my eyes. Mr. Hot DMV already has groupies. Lucky him. Half the women in town are over 60. I wonder if he knew how his presence affected our little town. Whoever he is was in for a big surprise. I can't wait to see him and take uh, an up-close-and-personal look-see for myself, Laura exclaimed. He claimed another victim. They're falling like dominoes. Lori, the local librarian, probably on her lunch hour, snorted like one of my horses. Oh, my God, if that didn't scare Ms. off Mr. D Hot DMV, nothing would. The myopic woman was your garden-variety cat lady who lived in an old Victorian on Pine Street. I suspected she hadn't changed her wardrobe since the 1970s all flowery and below the knee, and sensible shoes she bought yearly from the Sears in Dallas. She wore the same hairdo up and twisted, giving her face a pinched thin look and wore no makeup. Did I mention Lori is a Sunday school teacher at the local Baptist church? One of the more upstanding citizens of Granite Bay. Their conversation escalated into an all frenzy, loud and noisy, so I couldn't help but overhear every single word they said. I was merely a fixture of the 50s retro diner. Black and white floors, red Nagahide booths, paraphernalia on the wall, and an old jukebox that played music from the era. His name is Noah Benedict, Bella said in a loud whisper. Noah Benedict? Why did that name sound ring a bell? I could have sworn I heard that name before. My brain was too fuzzy from the lack of sleep after I stayed up late with a colicky horse. My prized Australian warm blood buttercup came down with a mild case of colic. I knew the minute she pawed at the ground and curled her lips, she was in distress. I took her temperature, which showed normal, then walked her around a bit. By the time I'd left the ranch, she had eaten some oats and drank water. It was such a relief I didn't have to call the vet. I left her in the care of, my, of Trace, my trusted barn manager. Another customer came in. Mrs. Cormack sat down at the counter to be filled in on Granite Bay's newest resident, no doubt, who needed a smartphone when Norma could spread the news faster than a speeding bullet. Bella, just the usual. Bella nodded and set a cup of black coffee in front of Norma Cormack. She took a sip and says the same thing every time. Bella, Mr. Cormack never knew what he missed. If he didn't know better, he would assume Mr. Cormack was dead. Unfortunately for Norma, he left her for a dyed blonde who lived the next county over. They were all scandalized until Norma told them she was glad Tom moved on. As she put it, he stopped putting out. God, what an image got seared in my brain. Like thinking about my parents having sex. Just ooh, too much information. Mrs. Cormack joined in the conversation about Mr. Hot DMV. Her thin lips formed an O gripped with the latest about the hot vet. Her eyes looked twice as thick with her thick glasses as she listened to Bella go on and on. Norma looked around as if she didn't want anyone to hear what she was about to say, but with her booming voice, that wasn't a possibility in a small cafe, cafe. I hear there is a scandal around him. Their voices lowered when Norma put her two cents in. I couldn't make out what they were saying. Geez. What the hell was I doing? Eavesdropping wasn't any better than gossiping. I had the rest of my latte, which turned cold. Is that what happens to people who live in a small town, grow old, gossip, and die? Just think of it, thinking about it made me depressed. I tried to convince myself my perfect orderly life suited me well. Even I didn't believe that shit. The little bell on the door tinkled again, signaling another patron. I had a clear view of the door from my corner booth. Ty came in and waved at me. She said hello to the ladies and ordered a sandwich to go. She came over and slid into the seat opposite of me. How's Buttercup? She's better, thanks. I could see the relief in her intense blue eyes. Ty understood how much my 15-year-old horse means to me since she was like my overly large kid. Not only is Ty Montgomery my best friend, she also works as my vet, as a vet tech. She's my go-to gal for everything, my problem, my animals, my everything. So not to change the subject or anything, how is Devin? I wink while she blushes. 
so I know things are going well. Devin Wallace is a tall drink of water. His lean, lanky body advertises those wranglers in a way that makes sinners out of saints. When those dark hazel green eyes of his landed on you, you are a goner. Ask any female within a 20-mile radius between the ages of 5 and 95. One mention of Devin and they all melt like chocolate. How she landed a dedicated bachelor is a mystery even to me. How are you doing that thing again? What thing? I snapped to attention. She caught me daydreaming again. How does she do that? You know exactly what I'm talking about. I was wondering how you landed Devin. I mean, you never mentioned how you two got together. It's a real it's a real mystery that has confounded a lot of women around here, including me. And since I'm your best friend, I at least deserve an explanation. But I crossed my heart not to tell, so help me God. And why are you wearing a scarf? It's nearly 80 degrees outside. I reach across and pull the scarf off and see the evidence tired they're trying to hide. A massive hickey. A wide grin confirms their worst fear. Ty is getting some action, but how much is another story? Ty rolls her eyes at me. Even her scrubs, she's adorable. Petite, blonde, and feisty as hell. Devin with his dark good looks contrasts Ty's blonde beauty. They made a cute couple, but I feel a pang of temporary jealousy too. But why? I've sworn off men forever. After the disastrous breakup with Dylan Roth, or as I call him, Dylan the villain, serial cheater extraordinaire. Any mention of Dylan makes my blood boil. Thank God I moved away from him and his harem. What is it with cheating men anyway? You promise never to repeat this to anyone living or dead? And she smiled impishly. I promise. Our moms got us together. What? I shake my head because I do not hear Ty correctly. They're mothers. Is this some kind of arranged marriage deal? I don't understand. Like a blind date? Ty knows Devin through her vet practice since he's one of their high-profile clients with a large cattle ranch and a damn fine lawyer in Salem. But the hint of any romance between them seemed a little far-fetched. After all, didn't at least three women try to rope that cowboy and attempted to get him down the aisle? Devin always managed to slip away and skate. The same couldn't be said of Casey, Charla, and Effie. A line of shattered hearts I didn't want to see Ty end up as one of the Deb's cast-offs. Ty deserves so much better. Kind of, like a blind date. We've known each other forever but ran in different circles. Ty blushes again. Something is up. Ty never blushes over any man, or so I thought. She's an alpha female and is never afraid to show her claws when needed. Her male-dominated profession, she needs a, a tough exterior. It's a matter of pride in growing and proving herself. From my vantage point, she's kicking ass in that arena. Fill it. My folks had Devin over for a barbecue. That's it? Yep, that's it, she confirmed. Wait a minute, you didn't look me in the eye. What else happened? Maybe one thing led to another and involved a bottle of Jack Daniels, the barn loft, and listening to Rascal Platt. It was so romantic, Kendo, she sighed. She's clearly smitten with Devin, maybe even love. Ty looked down at her hands, folded in her lap, clearly uncomfortable with my line of questioning. I put two and two together. They did it on the first date. Oh, my God. You had sex with Devin Wallace, didn't you? It was more of an accusation than a statement. I had to admit I'm a bit envious, too. My lady parts are in the middle of a drought. Shush, keep your voice down. Do you want the whole town to know? I think they already do. I look over and see three pairs of eyes staring our way. I mouth sorry to Ty, who seems ready to kill me on the spot. Shit. I am very protective. My overprotective father hears about this. I'm grounded for life. You're 30 years old, for Pete's sake. No longer live at home. What, poss- what possibly could happen? Nothing short of a shotgun wedding in these parts. Men did not mess with ranchers' daughters, including the eligible Dove and Wallace, unless they were a church service and a preacher involved. I'm dead, Ty slunk down in a booth. Your sandwich is ready to go, Ty. Bella smirked with a knowing smile like the old buffalo she is. Her menu should read, her specialty is a side of gossip. Forget the DMV, Noah Benedict is old news. Welcome to Devin Wallace and Ty Montgomery. I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't a prenup sign within 24 hours of the news broadcast. While I try to talk down Ty from her emotional ledge, I look up and lock eyes with the man who has the bluest eyes I've ever seen. Where did he come from? He just appeared out of nowhere like David Copperfield. I can't seem to tear my gaze away from him like he, like the slow down at an accident scene. You don't want to look, but some morbid curiosity wins out. My stomach flutters as does my pulse. Time stands still. All those sappy cliches happen in this one moment. He gives me a half smile and a wave like he knows me. I wave back in response. Every movement I make is purely animatronic, like Stepford wife. He crooks his finger at me in a playful way. 
I momentarily break the magical spell he's woven over me. I raise my eyebrow at him and return the challenge. By this time, I have regained my wits about me as he flashes a beautiful smile and makes me come all unglued again. Is this guy for real? I know deep down who he is, but the real is he acts like he knows me. I would remember him. His dark blonde hair is a little messy in a sexy way. With a smile that lights up his whole face, not to mention my body heat. Noah's exquisite to look at. His attire is a plain white t-shirt, jeans, and black Doc Martens. A swimmer's body, I think to myself. Muscled, ripped, and powerful. Noah Benedict looked like he just stepped out of a Calvin Klein commercial. By this time, Ty stops in mid-sentence about her compromised romance with Devin and follows my line of vision. Oh, that's the new vet, Noah Benedict, she says nonchalantly. She waves back at him. I told him to meet me here. I've got to go and show Noah around the clinic. I'll call you later. Ty is on a first-name basis with him? Holy shit. Then it dawns on me. He was waving at Ty, not me. I watch as Ty approaches Noah and they exchange a few words. He leans in and whispers a few words in Ty's ears. She laughs at whatever he said, apparently, at my expense. As they head out the door, Noah turns and winks and flashes those pearly whites at me again. God, I wonder what it'd be like to have him whisper in my ear like he did Ty's. A thousand fantasies erupt in my mind while the old buffaloes watch the entire incident. Maybe Mr. Hot D&B is back in the gossip fold. When the bell on the door rings again after their departure, I think an angel has gotten its wings. But for some reason, I speculate Noah Benedict likes to dance with the devil because I could have sworn I saw his horn. Awesome. I know that small town well. <laughs> and that coffee <laughs> shop. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Perfect. Lovely. And I think our readers really appreciated it. So um, I'm going to sign off. So thank you so much, Trisha, for being here. If you guys loved her thank reading, you. go find her and get her books, write a review for her. And thanks so much for being here. And we'll have you again when you um, do some other stuff. Yes. Thank you very much, Vicki. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hoped you loved hearing from the author as much as we did. If you did enjoy the author, make sure you find them on social media. Buy their book and write a review. Are you a published author and would like to be featured on the podcast? Visit us at our website to learn more. You can help support the production of this podcast by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Share the podcast with your friends. And most importantly, become a supporter. Supporters receive monthly bonus podcasts and a newsletter filled with tips from our authors. To find out more how to become a supporter, visit our website. And finally, I hope you always remember to enjoy the journey. Until next week, this is Vicki J. Carter saying goodbye. <music>